Hi everyone, this is Nitin and uh, today you know it just feels surreal that I'm actually talking to the Jack Schwager. You know, I mean Market Wizards is probably the only book I've re- actually read like multiple times in my life and I've read it every time I have had a drawdown. If you know any of you haven't read this book yet, I think you should go pick it up. Not just the Market Wizards, all the books that Jack's written and you know, also, you know, so all of them actually, you know, there are, there are probably over 15 of them, so and all of them, you know. So, uh, and today Jack, you know, after writing all the book is co-founding Fund Cedar. We are a broker who's trying to integrate with Fund Cedar. Hopefully we'll do this very soon. And to set the context, so I run a business called Zeroda, which is a brokerage firm in India. So we are the largest retail brokerage firm in India in terms of trading turnover. India has around 200 plus active retail brokering firms. Uh, the, the challenge that we all face in India is that we have a population of 1.3 billion, but the number of people who actively invested in India last year was just like 5 million, less than 0.4% of the population. And, and we're probably, you know, two to three decades uh, behind uh, a US market. Uh, you know, stock exchanges in India truly opened up only in the late 90s. Uh, Internet trading and derivatives trading started early 2000s. Commodities and currency trading started like late 2000s, right? And uh, and today, most of the trading turnover in the Indian markets comes from the, you know, two index derivatives, a broader market index called the Nifty and the and the banking index called the Bank Nifty, you know? So so derivatives around this actually contribute more than 70% of all turnover on the exchanges. One of the reasons why, you know, I think historically, you know, the participation has been very low in India has been because bank fixed deposits, you know, uh, were yielding as much as 12% at one point of time. I mean, it's come down now, but, you know, there was no real incentive for people to actually look at another asset class. And real estate in India just uh, outperformed all other asset classes in the last 10, 15 years. So, you know, so people are uh, more invested in real estate and only recently in the last one, two years, you know, real estate has kind of peaked out and gold, which has been like traditional Indian asset has also not been performing. So, you know, people are actually looking at the stock markets. So, you know, so, so we might potentially in the next three, five years get like 100 new million uh, traders to the market. So, yeah, that's just to set a context of, you know, how India is doing. So, I mean, thanks a lot for doing this, Jack. Sure. You're an author, but but you've also traded most of your life. Just curious to know what kind of a trader were you? I mean, were you actively day trading? Or... No, I'm ne- I was never... Day trading is one thing I've never done or been attracted to. Um, I went through different phases. I started out at the very beginning when I didn't know anything, uh, which is not to imply that the methodology is wrong. It just was wrong for me um, as fundam- you know, trading on fundamentals in commodities. And um, I eventually, uh, when I became familiar with technical analysis, um, and the risk management associated with that, I pretty much became a chart-oriented trader. And then I went through a phase where, because I also related to, I guess, the books I was, uh, the books um, I wrote, and also related to the, I actually created some trading systems for the brokerage firm uh, I was the director of research for, but, and I actually was even a CTA for a small, for a period as a partner. So I was got involved in system trading. I ultimately, I ultimately decided it wasn't right for me because well, it was a basically trend-oriented uh, systematic trading, and even later on, in, uh, combining that with some counter trend to to lessen the volatility, uh, and no, and nothing wrong with the system, the approach, but I didn't. I thought I would like uh, systematic trading more because. It would completely move the emotion. What I found is I didn't like not having the control. So, if you're truly trading a system, then you then you have to stick with the system, and that's it. and a system to work correctly, particularly if it's primarily generating its profits from trend following. If it's really designed correctly, it's going to as a byproduct give you periodic large drawdowns, and I just was not comfortable with that, uh, particularly. You're sort of surrendering your decision process to the computer, which is just, I didn't like the open-ended. You didn't know, it's not like you knew exactly where where the opposite, you know, where the liquidation signal would come. It could vary, so you didn't really know what the amount of risk would be when things were going bad. So ultimately, I ended up just going back to chart analysis with risk management. And the chart analysis, I should explain, is not just a matter of looking for classical chart patterns, it's a matter of that, but actually, as I wrote in, 
in my technical analysis book and fundamental and the and the futures book, um, I consider failures of patterns actually more significant than the patterns themselves. Um, so uh, not necessarily just trading patterns, but also failures of patterns and also being willing to trade counter trend in the sense that uh, where let's say I would have objectives for a trade where I think the move would be largely, should be largely done. And there was also other factors which suggest a resistance. And you got similar conclusions on 10 year charts and one year charts. And, uh, and we have multi and maybe even had retracer Fibonacci retracements that coincided. So when you had multiple factors coincide for a trend running out, or uh, it's not that I was trying to pick a top or a bottom, but simply saying, this is a reasonable area for the market to stall. And so those are also types of trades I would do. So they're not necessarily just trades going exactly counter trend, but the one thing they all have in common is that every trade is accompanied by, at least in the futures market, is accompanied by a protective stop when I do the trade. So um, I, there was no, uh, there's no reason to, uh, to be concerned about so-called selling into a rally or buying into a decline, uh, because those trades have every much as had every much as a, a same type of risk protection as if I was going with the trend, uh, and they weren't so much again trying to pick a bottom or a top. It was simply a matter of of you know uh, every all moves have certain amounts of potential, and it was just a matter there in those type of trades of of saying this is a reasonable area to uh, to look for the more, for the trend to stall and at least correct. Um, yeah. And sometimes that would also be accompanied, not necessarily by just going straight into it, but by looking for some signs of the market stalling, you know. So that's essentially, so that's essentially my pathway and what I ultimately evolved to, which is not to say that that is the right way to trade. It's simply what was comfortable for me. And and I've also heard your transition from like a fundamental trader to becoming a discretionary technical trader because of all the risk management benefits you got out of you know technical analysis. Yeah, that's a that's that's the thing. See that um, it's kind of interesting. And this is again, I'm not pushing. I've interviewed traders who made millions or hundreds of millions even um, on uh, you know on fundamentals. So I'm not knocking fundamentals. Uh, it, you know, if it's right for certain people, it's not, you know, I've, I've seen both kinds. I've seen traders who've done tremendously well with fundamentals and traders who've done phenomenally well with technical. But for my for myself, the problem I always had with, with fundamentals is that inherently in the approach, the more wrong you are, the more sense it seems to make to add to the position, right? So if I... Uh, you know, if, if I think that um, some uh, some market is underpriced at say six dollars, and I go long because my fundamentals tell me that this is cheap and the the commodity should now go up, and if it goes to five fifty and nothing has changed, then logically, what should I? It's even it's even a better deal, and I should buy more. I certainly shouldn't get out. So. Not only doesn't fundamentals have any intrinsic risk management to it, it's by its very nature, it's almost anti-risk management. Uh, because if you're trying to establish value to a certain item, if it's going against you without any change, and I keep it emphasizing without any change of the of the facts, because if the facts change, that's different. Uh, I mean, if it's uh, if you uh, if there's uh, like you go long because you think it's a certain value in a commodity and Reports come out and they show the crops are so facts have changed. That's different. But if nothing, but often markets, nothing will change and the price will go much lower or much higher than you think is reasonable. And as a fundamental uh, trader, you, you know, you're almost, uh, your logical step would seem to be to, to add more to a losing position. And, you know, from a risk management standpoint, of course, that's not very good. Um, whereas technical, assuming, assuming that you are, uh, a trend, you know, you're going with the trend, or even if you're not, like I gave you examples where I was uh, putting on, I put on trades a lot of times which are totally counter trend, but 
the with technical analysis, I can say, okay, I expect the market to fail in this zone. And if it goes beyond this zone by 100 points, then my call is just wrong and I'm out. And I'm out. So even if I'm going down the trend, you could still apply risk management because technical analysis establishes a an area where you want to buy or sell and you any reasonable approach you have should allow should allow for asking the question where am i wrong and uh, and that allows for placing a, a, a risk management stop whereas in fundamentals you know the, the market going against you is not a sign that you're wrong <laughs> it almost implies that that it's a you should put on more so that's that's the that's the crux of why I completely transitioned away from fundamentals. But again, I know and I've interviewed many people who who think that technical analysis is is a bunch of malarkey, and <laughs> uh, and uh, have done tremendously well in fundamentals. So it's really what what's right for you. But I'm telling you, for me, uh, why fundamentals weren't right. So, so the people you interviewed over towards technical analysis traders kind of made more money than, or, or you know, the number of traders you've interviewed. I mean, is there were you able to kind of find any trend there, saying that more people made money of trading technical analysis versus fundamental analysis? No, no, and and actually that wouldn't be a, uh, a valid sample because I I'm picking a very biased sample, so it, it doesn't represent anything statistically. Um, and it's just a question of who am I asking to, to interview. So um, how many were how many were fundamentals? How many were tech, uh, technicians? It's simply a product by who I asked. It doesn't really prove anything. Uh, so, but I what I what I did walk away from, uh, what I did walk away with, uh, I should say, is the idea that it, it's not that one is right or wrong. It's that some approach is right or wrong for each person. So in the audience listening to, to this, there'll be some of the audience for whom technical analysis is just not a fit, and there'll be some from fundamental analysis is not a fit. Just like there'll be some who think that long-term trading is horrible and they can't stand it, and there'll be right. some, and there'll be some who think that day trading is ridiculous and 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 bleeds money. And again, it, it's what, and there'll be some people who who will gravitate to want to trade futures, and some people who want to trade stocks, and. So, so all these variations, um, or some people want to trade systematic, some people want to trade discretionary, all these variations are a matter of what's right for the individual person. And if anybody tells you this is the way that you should be trading, run, run because <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. There is no right way to be trading for anybody. Uh, I mean, there is a right way for each person, but there is no universal right ways. That makes a lot of sense. Now, talking about systematic trading, you know, so I mean, uh, one of the challenges in India, right, as in, is that retail traders don't really have, you know, access to as advanced tools. I mean, we are trying to build a lot of it for our, our clients, you know, and, and most of our community doesn't even understand programming, you know, so I mean, they just introduce, getting introduced to all the concepts. Do you think the systematic trading is, is, is like, yeah. is like a thing? I mean, should everyone practice a strategy before they actually take it live? I mean, if they're yes, I mean if if they're if they're going to be trading, yeah, yeah. So let, let's define what we mean here. If if you mean if they're going to be trading a specific rule that can be mathematically defined, like uh, I'm going to uh, simple example, I'm I'm going to buy every time the 10-day moving average moves above the 40-day moving average, or something simple like that. If that's what they're going to do, and you know, lots of software will give simple you know technical indicators like that. If that's what they're going to do, yes, they should back test because, uh, you know, for, first of all, if they made money in the past, there's no guarantee it'll make money in the future. But what you can say, if it hasn't worked in the past, or even if it's made money, but if it's, but if it's been so volatile that you, it's unlikely you could have ever stayed with it, and if that's what it looks like in the past, there's no reason to expect it to suddenly start working in the future. So if what you're doing is truly the Definable by a set of rules, either simple or even complicated, then yeah, then then you should back test because the first thing should be to verify uh, that what you want to do works. Now, for some approach like what I described to you, you really can't back test. Like that's that's purely, you know, you're looking at charts, you're looking at various things, you're looking at different timeline charts. 
you you see one thing, you see another thing. It's it's purely it's purely individualistic and it's not mathematically definable. I mean, you could maybe set a whole bunch of rules. I mean, I shouldn't say it's not definable, but e even if you defined it, it wouldn't be exactly what you're really doing anyway. So, uh, so for that type of approach, it's really hard to backtest. And, and also for that type of approach, uh, it, the system doesn't really work. I mean, you really can't, you can't put that down in a, in a reasonable set of rules. So uh, it's really totally discretionary. And, and for something like that, then knowing how to program is totally unnecessary because the approach is not one that is systematic. But then, but then, can you get to that level? You know, I'm guessing you know you are there because you've spent so many years trading the markets, right? As in, but to get there without blowing out, you know, I mean, do you think, do you think systematic trading is is you know is is a better order of you know staying in the money, you know, I mean, or at least stay break even? I mean, uh, let you play the game for longer because uh, you're following uh, a bunch of rules. I don't think it's systematic versus discretionary. I think it's risk management, good risk management versus versus poor risk management or or no risk management. Um, <laughs> so uh, that is, I think, the crux. So it's not a question if you have a system or not. You can have a system, and it could take you into a sixty percent drawdown, and then you just give up, and you know you're out of the game, you know, uh, and have lost a lot of money. So having a system doesn't doesn't really translate to not having significant losses or getting knocked out. The best bet for limiting losses and and staying in the game is actually appropriate is having good risk management. And so I think the first step for anybody is to first figure out what their methodology is. And how do you do that? Well, you read a lot, you read books, uh, you read articles, maybe you read stuff on the web, I don't know, but whatever, and you see what resonates and then you form, start forming some ideas while looking at markets. And then and then before you even trade, if you have ideas of how you would trade if you weren't going to trade, then then start paper trading. Now, paper trading isn't isn't like real trading. The motions aren't there and all that. But still, if you can't make money paper trading, again, there's no point starting with real money. So, right. uh, so you develop a methodology when you think you have one or as you're developing it, watch markets, see – Try applying, saying, "Okay, let's see. I would go long here. Now let's, and I would, and I would get out here. Let's see what happens." And you follow the right, and you just keep a paper record of of what you would have done if you didn't let your emotions hold sway. If you were just doing whatever analysis or or assessment of the markets you were doing, and see how that works. And if it looks like you're making more money than you're losing, and your losses aren't too large, then start with a small amount of money. And, uh, and and the other piece of advice here is whatever you start with, you can start with more money, but the important thing is not so much how much money you start with. The important thing is how much you're willing to allow to lose before you stop trading. So my recommendation, almost anybody, but certainly to beginning traders, is, okay, you have a certain amount of money, let's just call it X. Um, you define... How much am I? Well, let's just say it's. Let's just take a round number. Don't even define the currency. Let's say. Let's say it's a hundred thousand, whatever. Okay. You know, in any currency, it doesn't make a difference. And let's say uh, uh, you're willing to lose ten thousand, and after that, you you know, some it's just not working. You want to. So then you could start out with that, and you have risk management. Then, but if you get to ten thousand. Then you liquidate everything and take a break, go back to the drawing boards, come back in six months if you feel you're ready. But what doing that type of approach to starting trading will achieve is it will keep keep you, if you follow it, it will keep you from losing more money than you felt, you know, comfortable. More more money than you felt was acceptable. Of course, nobody likes to lose any money. So I don't know, no, losing money isn't coming <laughs> in any sense. But I'm saying there are levels of money you can lose. You say, you know, okay, I can take X X dollars or X rupees or whatever, and I could if I can lose that, my life's not going to change. I'm not going to be happy about it, but I'll just consider it a life experience and learning experience, and that's okay. I can certainly nothing's going to change. So. If that's if you start in a trading and then you have a cutoff point like that, if you stop, okay. You know, when I started trading, the only thing that saved me was because I was very bad in the beginning. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. Uh, 
And the only thing that saved me is, well, one is I didn't have much money, which was a great thing because I couldn't lose very much. Thanks. And the other thing is I then, because I didn't have very much money, and I started trading each time with ridiculously small amounts, like $3,000 or something like that. Um, so uh, when I even when I had more money, I still uh, would not start for a large amount. And and uh, if I did, I would always like, but I would actually trade smaller. I, I, I was... I traded in a way, I traded like a coward. In other words, I never wanted to lose much. And where all my big losses always came after I'd made money, you know, so always. And that's my that's my biggest weakness. I'm aware of that. <laughs> and, uh, and I know it, uh, but it still doesn't stop me sometimes from doing it. Uh, although I think I've, you know, I've reduced that. Um, however, uh, one thing I always was good at was not allowing myself to lose much when I started trading, uh, you know, each time when I started. And I don't trade all the time. I've been way too busy in my life to to devote too much time to trading. Uh, yeah. even right now, as we speak, right now, I am not trading, uh, uh, although I intended to sort of beginning and in the beginning of the year, but I'm just too darn busy. And I just don't have time. It's just, it's just not a priority. So uh, you know, if I have like, you know, it has to be almost like a hobby for me to go back to it. Uh, so uh, right now, I've just got too many other things going on with Fun Cedar and other things. And uh, I just also, I'm, I'm at an age where I value my, my leisure time. I'm, I, I like doing, I'm, I live in an outdoor place, uh, Boulder, Colorado. I, I like cross-country skiing. I like hiking. And I, you know, at this point in my life, uh, I don't need to make more money for, for, for the lifestyle I'm living. <laughs> I, I don't live very, uh, I mean, I live comfortably, but I, I'm not extravagant. Uh, I've never owned a boat in my life or wanted to or anything like that. I mean, I <laughs> own the, yeah, the kayak and that, that I, that's different. But, um, but so I, I don't want to sacrifice that part of my life either. So it, it, it so, uh, and I don't even have enough time to read what I want to read. So right now, sort of trading is sort of the bottom of the list of, of priorities and it doesn't need to be done. And. So I'm not doing it. Uh, and that's an important thing. Um, it's a general lesson there is uh, people shouldn't trade unless they want to trade because of a passion for trading. Like it's a game, it's a hobby, right? So so if I felt about trading like I feel about cross-country skiing, I'd be trading, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, but people need to, I think too many people want to get it into trading because they want to get rich, and it's the wrong reason. You have to, if you if you want to succeed in trading, then the motivation really not has, to, the motivation really shouldn't be getting rich because you're probably not going to get rich. You probably end up losing money if that's your motivation. The motivation really has to be, wow, this is a fascinating game. I've got some, I, I've read all this stuff. I know stuff. I'm watching the markets. I've got some ideas. I think I've got some ideas. How of things that could work, and how I can make money, and uh, still control risk, and and boy, if I can do that, that would be such a thrill. So if that's your attitude, yeah, you know, that's how you might succeed. Uh, every almost, I think everybody I interviewed, you can get it out of the interviews themselves. You can almost, you can almost sense their their passion for the game, right? Uh, right. And sort of, and I'm not a natural trader, never have been. And I think one reason is because I've never had that passion of the people that I interview. Yeah, no, but but you know, I was just talking to you know our team here, and you know, so I was I was telling you know like is, like trading is is kind of a way of life, right? I mean, you kind of do things where you think you have better risk to reward. I mean, I think you're a great trader because you actually gone ahead and you know wrote all these best selling books, you know. So I mean, and 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 you're getting to do what you want to do it. You know, uh, so so I mean, I I'd say you are one of the best traders I know. <laughs> so no, no, actually, I'm not. Yeah, you know, I, I I'm net profitable only because I have enough experience to be. But I'm in, you know, my nat. I don't have the natural talents of the people that I interviewed for trading. And I think, and I know that I have the the passion. It's been for me. It's been like you know, on a sideline. And uh, you know, I've, I've been privileged to interview so many great traders, and uh, you know, been influenced along the way, and learn right things and wrong things, and also for my own trading experience. Uh, so, yeah. 
talking about risk risk management right i mean uh, see most of the audience that's listening to this would be uh, you know retail traders right i mean and i heard you say that you shouldn't take more than 1% you know risk on a trade i mean if if someone's kind of working in a smallish uh you know like a portfolio size you know i mean how does how does he ever get big by just taking a 1% bet you know i mean is it is it even possible over a longer period of time you know i mean it's the, the fact that we the reality of limited resources doesn't change the truth for the fact that bet size should be small i mean that's a mathematical truism and uh, you know the mathematics and the markets don't care about how much how much you can afford to the how much money you can afford to trade or lose uh the reality is if you want to be successful your trade size should probably be 1% or and in fact or less as i've gotten older and i've read my original books where you know or well, let's say it was uh when i produced audios for them or had you know I had to listen to the audio and i can remember coming in fact i this is kind of interesting and did the audio i think it was for new market wizards i i got the rights back for the book and hired my own narrator uh, who's a who's a phenomenal narrator but uh, you know so as he produced his chapter i was listening to it you know sort of as a podcast instead of my regular podcast and came across this line where somewhere i think i said that uh, in my conclusions of the summary of the book that one of the things you should limit your risk to this to very small and trade to about one i think i'm going to use 1 or 2% uh or less and what i what i thought was after reading after listening to the whole book almost everything in the book i had i would not have changed on anything there were actually two things that struck me and this is so almost humorous there were only two things that struck me that i would have changed if i wrote the book now which is more than 20 years later and i just had a whole book there were like two things one was that line about 1 to 2% now i feel it should be 1% maximum and ideally a half a percent or less and the other one was um i think i had an analogy somewhere in there i think it was mine or a trader's but i may have been a maybe it might have been a trader at the analogy it wasn't me but about um it was using like dieting as a uh, as a, an analogy and I said like all stuff about like everybody knows the right thing to do but it's a matter of doing it so <laughs> i so he was using the analogy like you can exercise everybody knows what you need to do you exercise you don't eat fat you know and i remember listening to that and i trip tripping over and i say of course <laughs> now with the science that's totally wrong you don't need okay. sugars but but so those are the only two things that i would have you know and if if i forget if i think it was a trader said it and i i certainly would have footnoted it then saying this is not scientifically true of course i assume if i had done the uh, uh uh you know the interview now it would have been different you know <laughs> i know so so all the traders you interviewed you, you, do you think a lot of these guys actually followed this this 1% to 2% i mean then and no no they, of- uh, not all of them but a lot of them well they all they i wouldn't even say they all had rigorous risk management because some of them uh didn't didn't use risk management in that sense in some cases their ability to uh, to identify value value stocks and hold those positions and diversify among positions was good enough for them to realize extremely good gain with uh, acceptable drawdowns uh so somebody like uh Joel um no I let me use another example uh, uh uh Martin Taylor who at the time I interviewed him this was in the last uh full market was books I did hedge fund market was this and this is back I think I interviewed him in 2011 but at the time he was managing 7 billion dollars and he was in the process of uh closing up all his funds now He wasn't closing up his funds because he had a problem. He just had gotten tired of managing for, you know, investors and had enough money and was just going to have one fund with his own money and accept a few friends and family and maybe a few investors he knew wouldn't bother him and that was that. But um he had a, he had achieved a, you know, extremely good track record over many years, primarily initially in emerging markets, but then he branched out also to doing uh 
to doing uh, established markets as well. Uh, so he, and he he did not he specifically closed these funds for because he didn't want to have to manage to a certain maximum loss per month. So too many like institutional investors would have like rules that you, they can't accept a manager who would lose like more than let's say six or seven percent a month. Well, he realized that there were going to be months that he was going to lose that much because he had because he had a position that was seeing interim losses, but he had to stay with it. And this this is actually a true example. This has actually occurred during the interview. Uh, well, I interviewed him during, during one of his worst drawdowns. He was down about 14, 15 percent. And his biggest yeah. position uh, by far, and the one that was causing all the pain, no, well, not all the pain, I'm sorry, that's the wrong word. The one that was causing the losses, at least at the moment, uh, was Apple. And uh. he was not, he would never in a million years consider giving up Apple. He, I'd never seen anybody so wildly bullish on, or bearish on a position as he was an Apple. And to put it in context, this was when Apple was $350 before the split. And, oh. <laughs> uh, and it was six months after that interview, it was $700. And the reason he was so sure was because he knew his numbers very well. And he, he, he saw what all the analysts were predicting. He saw that they were basically extrapolating previous earnings forward into the future and that's how they were getting the valuations and he understood that what they were missing was the giant explosion in sales that was going to occur overseas particularly china and he he was confident that that was that was the right you know that was going to happen and so something like that would never have a risk you know a money management risk and if he did his whole approach would kind of crumble so there are approaches, there are managers out there which are exceptions, but hey, that's that's somebody who's like truly expert and that's, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> right? I, I mean, so uh, um, it's like uh, going down an expert, uh, an expert ski hill, uh, uh, you know, an, an expert can go down at, a, at, an, at what may seem like an unsafe speed. It doesn't mean it's okay for somebody who's taking their first lesson to go up and try to do the same thing, right? Got it. So, so when you say what, like less than one person, so this is a maximum loss on a trade, or this is actually the the money you put on the trade? I mean, uh, oh no, no, the the amount the, the, the money you, the amount of money that's margining the trade is kind uh -huh. of irrelevant. All that counts, right. is all that counts is what you're going to lose on the trade if you're wrong. So, uh, it doesn't make a difference how much money it is. It's just your loss on each trade should be limited to about one percent per trade. Now yeah. you could have it could be more than that if realistically you 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 know let's say you have a hundred thousand dollars but you only have ten thousand in the account you know but you're really thinking in terms of you're trading it like it's a hundred thousand because you know well when you need more margin you'll put it in okay but if that's true if you're not if it's not a matter of you're kidding yourself but if you truly think of your stake as $100,000 and you only have $10,000 in the account, well, it's fine, fine to have a you know, $1,000 risk on a trade because you're really thinking of your of your stake as 100, not as 10. But whatever your true stake is, whatever your true account size is, it doesn't all have to be in because you may be adding margin as you need it. That's, that's what you're measuring against. And 1% is not, the 1% is, is a type of thing so you could be wrong a number of times and not do un undue damage. Too many people think, oh, I only got 5% on a trade. It's not a big deal. Well, a few 5% losses and you're out of the game. So so I, I know that, you know, I've heard you say that Ed Top is your favorite, you know, uh, amongst everyone you've interviewed. And, and I think, you know, one of those things that he introduced to the world was like the bet sizing thing, right? So do you think it's important? I mean, not to just evenly bet all trades, you know, uh, kind of bet more yeah. on trades. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Thorpe was, uh, yeah, it's hard. People ask me always who's my favorite, and I said I really don't know, but if I kind of, like I say, who was like maybe the most impressive person or achieved the most, I, I'd say maybe at Thorpe. But it's it's tough because there's so many people, you know, so many people who did phenomenal. So uh, it's, it's a tough question to answer. But the one thing about Thorpe, because <laughs> the thing about Thorpe that almost nobody can match except Jim Simmons, maybe of Renaissance, uh, is uh, maybe even as better. I don't know. Uh, but Thorpe, uh, when he ran his first hedge fund, had uh, had such a remarkable. He had in 19 years only three losing months, and they were all under one percent. 
and his gains were larger than that. Uh, and I did a simple, simple binomial probability calculation with conservative assumptions. Conservative because I considered wins and losses equal size, whereas wins were larger. So, and I calculated that the probability of his of his his results were equivalent to randomly picking one atom from the mass of the Earth, not the surface, <laughs> the entire the entire global mass, and then randomly picking the same atom. That probability actually is larger than the probability of getting Thorpe's record, but if the markets were efficient and if everything was random. So uh, in that sense, there's nobody else I could say something like that about. I mean, that was such a, um, he was more of a refutation of the efficient market hypothesis of anybody that I interviewed. Uh, that's, you know, so it, it's on, on those, th- and also he had like, uh, he's just a brilliant guy. He's a you know, PhD mathematician. He would have been a PhD physicist if you bothered to finish his thesis, which he abandoned because he decided to, he didn't know enough math and then got his PhD in math and forgot about the thesis. Uh, he, he developed the Black-Scholes model or equivalent mathematical equivalent than that years before the paper was published, but just made just used it himself to make money. Um, you know, so it's just a, a, on and on. He invented a lot of strategies that hedge funds right. use, like statistical arbitrage, convertible arbitrage. He was like the first guy to be doing these, this stuff. So for all those reasons, now on bet size, he's actually not famous as a, as a manager or as a trader. To the world, he's famous because he wrote this book, How to Beat the Dealer, which uh, kind of told people how to how to beat the how, the casinos at blackjack. And right. his brilliant insight was that even though even though the casinos have the edge, even if you play all your cards perfectly, that if you varied your bet size, and this goes into a different element, this goes outside the risk management part of it, but he, he said if you vary your bet size so you are betting more on higher probability hands, then you can take a game with a negative edge and turn it into a positive edge. And so the uh, that's kind of a fascinating idea. You have a you have a game where the casino actually has the edge, but if you bet bigger when the car, of course, now you can't do it because thanks to Ed Thorpe uh, many years ago, the casinos <laughs> yeah. changed the way they uh, they operated. You know, like multiple decks, they shuffle more often. But back in those days, you theoretically could have done it. So he demonstrated that you could take a game where you have a mathematically negative edge, but if you change the bet sizes so you're betting more on high probability uh, situations, you can take that negative edge, turn it into a positive edge and a large one. Um, or not large, but enough to be making uh, a lot of money. And in trading, the, the implication there is if you've got like, sort of multiple types of trades you do, and then you analyze your trades, you see that certain trades you do much better, uh, you know, much better success rate than other trades. Uh, then if you kind of take larger stakes on those trades that are more reliable, you can, even if your whole approach as a whole was a losing approach, if you just bet more on the ones, on the types that were more likely to work, you could turn it into a positive approach. So the bottom line is that by you want to vary bet size by your assessment of the probabilities of, of how good a trade looks. So other thing, you know, other very popular instrument uh, to trade in India is actually the derivatives. The futures and options are extremely popular right now. Leverage is, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's kind of a, like one of those weapons of mass destruction, right? So, I mean, how have, you know, all the traders that you inter- interviewed, you know, I mean, actually handled the leverage? I mean, were they extremely leveraged uh, generally or, you know, they, you know, they, they weren't or, uh, not, you know, to, for the most part, not, no. Uh, and leverage really is, um, it, it's, if you're using, now I'm going back to the majority of traders, which is, which is rigorous risk management, right? Like we talked about, I gave you one example, there's others of some people who didn't for, for reasons that it wasn't consistent with their approach and they had other skills to make up, you know, to compensate for that. But for most people, uh, risk management is is important, and and if you have appropriate risk management, then the leverage isn't important because if you're leveraging, then you're you're basically taking a much larger position. But if you're doing that, then your 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 exit point's much closer because you're still not risking more than a specified amount, right? So if I'm only going to risk one percent on a trade, 
and I'm going to trade five times as high as I would normally, and I normally risk 1%, um, uh, you know, for that size, then uh, and, a certain, and that size implies the stop is a certain distance from the current price. Well, if I'm going to be trading five times as large, then my stop should be five times as close. Now, that's not the right thing to do, but there may be trading setups where, let's say, the market's in extremely narrow range and the volatility is going way down and you have reasons to expect that the market's going to explode on the upside. Well, in a situation like that, you might take a very large position, much larger than normal, because you can define an exit point that's much closer because you're saying, well, I'm going, the reason I'm going, doing this large trade is because I think the market is going to explode on the upside out of here and and I've got a very close stop point I can identify that's meaningful. In other words, my, my whole premise is that the market's going to come out at a narrow, narrow band on the upside. If it goes out on the downside, by more than some specified amount, then I'm wrong and I'm out. So it's a situation where you can define a reasonably close stop, and let's say it's also a situation that you have a high confidence in a trade. So in a situation like that, you can you can put on a much larger position, but your exit points could be much closer than normal. So now, you know, for every one successful trader you interviewed, and I mean, there might have been like a thousand who didn't make it, right? And, or maybe more, right? And also, you know, a lot of these people that you interviewed have gone to zero and bounced back multiple times, some of them, right? So, so when do you think, you know, a retail trader should, should maybe say, you know, uh, stop trading? So you're right. I had a number of traders who completely wiped out before they were successful. And, you know, and like I remember in my interview with Michael Marcus, which was the first uh, chapter of the first Marco Wizards book, and he this tale of how many how many times he failed and how bad the failures were. I, I literally asked him, "Didn't you just think you should stop trading? What what made you think you could trade?" But he had this. Just he just felt he could do it. He just felt he could do it, and he just was not going to give up. So um, that's something that comes internally. It's not something that you can define for people in general. It's something inside a, per a person. But my, what I'm saying is, to, what I said before, uh, is that if you don't allow yourself to lose too much each time you, you, you start as a trader, then you won't damage yourself so badly that you'll pre to prevent your trying again in the future. So uh, I think that's why it's so important not to risk too much uh, when you enter the markets. And uh, yeah, some people are not going to be cut out for trading. There's no question about that. Not everybody's going to be a great trader. You know, not everybody was a born, not everybody's a born musician, right? Uh, right? People, some people just have a natural talent or inclination for it, and some people don't. Um, and the talent could be different. I mean, somebody like Marcus was a very intuitive trader, and take two people we talked about. And somebody like Thorpe, well, he's a pure quant guy, just a just a GM mathematical genius, and he would just figure out inefficiencies in the markets that nobody else had realized. And that's why he has such an incredibly uh, lopsided win-to-loss ratio, like, I don't know, like 290 wins to three losses or whatever it was, because he had, uh, by months, I mean, and uh, because he had, he was able to use his mathematical skills and creative analytics to figure out strategies that just had a very high probability of success. Um, so that's a talent, you know, it's not a trading talent the way we think of trading talent, but it was a talent that could be exploited in the markets. And so the people who succeed have some sort of talent, whether it's intuitive, whether it's a quantitative and able to translate it into a way to take money out of the market, but they have some special talent. Not everybody is going to be uh, is going to be a, a, a great trader or even even a, a moderately successful trader. I think if if uh, one thing I can say, if, if people, uh, before they start trading, read enough, educate themselves enough, uh, understand the right things to do, um, have appropriate risk management, have a plan, you know, all do all the things that I like recommend in my books, um, and do it all, then... Um, they'll have a reasonable chance with experience, add, add experience to that, that plus experience and plus sticking to your risk management, 
I think you know most people could end up probably being that profitable given that uh, there still only will be a small percentage that are great, but you know, uh, but doing everything right can get you to profitability. It won't necessarily make you great unless you also have the innate talent. Right, and and also I mean trading and you know kind of as a full time you know like put the money on the you know like a full time income to just you know keep your family running etc. You know it puts that added pressure. You know, to perform, you know, which which potentially can, you know, uh, not be that such a great thing for a trader. So, what do you suggest? No, you suggest, yeah, you suggest that someone should have another income source and trade. You know, when someone getting it's started, it's very or? hard. It's very hard to earn a living trading. Some people do it, um, and uh, like yeah, you know, obviously traders that I that I interviewed, but I think of a a trader as a friend who actually also lives in Colorado, Peter Brandt, who has a uh, blog and he actually has a recommendation site uh, he puts his own trades on and i think and he you know he puts it in real time he puts his own trades on oh, nice i think last year was up like over 35 percent or whatever but he uh, but he's very big on well on chart analysis and risk management we, we've actually we're very similar in the way we we think and look at markets although he's much more skillful uh but somebody like peter brandt has earned his living all these years uh for 40 plus years you know as a trader I could never do that. Um, I I would be thinking, well, if I lose money this month, how am I going to pay the mortgage? You know, so um, it's not for everybody. Uh, I think. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it's. It, I think for most people, if it's going to be financial pressure, if you're going to, if you need to make money, actually, I'll give you, I'll give you an actual example of one of the great traders of all time, Stanley Druckenmiller. Uh, you know, a legend, basically. Uh, not only, I mean, uh, he ran George Soros's funds for I don't know how many, quite a number of years. He was actually running the main fund uh, while George Soros was in Eastern Europe. And when the wall came down, he was trying to get those countries uh, converted over to democracies and spending a lot of en energies and efforts in other interests. And the, the person running the shop was uh, was Druckenmiller, and so a lot of the quantum fund results in those years or were primarily Druckenmiller. I mean, Soros would call in and stuff like that. But uh, Druckenmiller ran his own hedge fund for close to 40 years and compounded at about 30% a year. I mean, an enormously great record. Now, there was a point early in his career where he didn't have much money and his expenses were, you know, were eating up and uh, he, just, he, he just didn't, he just was going month to month and uh, he was going to have to close. He he didn't. He was supposed to get some money from an, from an investor, I believe, and he didn't get it. And the business wasn't generating enough money to support the expenses. So he had this idea that interest rates were going to go down, and he took a really large position. Now this was, I think, in 1979 or 80, which was basically the top of. Well, he took it in euro dollars, but it was basically the peak of a giant bull market in bonds and. And interest rates, and he missed it by about oh he was he missed the top by about ten days, but wow. he 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 had he got stopped out of trade because he just didn't have the money to hold the position, and he just he had he had to win on a trade, and if you have right. to win, if you ever have to win on a trade, it, yeah. So I mean, this is like the perfect example. It's one of the great traders of our time. It's uh it's one of the great trading calls of our time like picking nearly the exact top of one of the biggest bull markets I've ever seen in my lifetime. And and despite that, losing, why? Because he had to win on that particular trade. Got so it. if you have to win, if you need to make money trading to pay the mortgage, as I said before, that's 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 itself is a recipe for disaster. So you can't need the money. And now if once you get ahead, once you have some certain level of financial cushion and then you know you, you can uh, then you can if you can afford to take a year or two and try to make it as a trader and if it doesn't work you got something else to fall back on and your life can go on as it was before yeah so there's circumstances where you can certainly try to do it but for most people uh trying to just go flat out and earn a, earn a living as a trader without having any uh, substantial financial resources and needing to be profitable to support yourself that is not a good recipe. 
Absolutely. Now, the first book is like almost 20 years old. So do you think the almost, rules of the game? Almost 30. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Almost 30. Almost oh, 30. Jesus. <laughs> right. So, so do you think the rules of the game have changed? I mean, uh, I mean, with AI and all the HFTs and, and, and all, I mean, is, is if you were to write a market wizard today, you think it would, uh, and I mean, the same thing that you said, uh, you wrote 30 years back, you know, would it yeah. still apply well, the rules? I wouldn't have trading floors in it, <laughs> which made for some of the best stories. Yes. And I wouldn't have uh, clicking quote boards, uh, uh, quote boards, uh, you know, which went the way the dinosaur about four, 30, 40 years ago. So there are certain things that, you know, uh, and and certain new things, you know, of course, I mean, all of electronic trading didn't exist. So that's so so the markets have changed. Uh, oh, computers. Uh, we didn't have back when I wrote the first. Well, we had computers. But it was still early. It was still early on. The first market, uh, where's the book? PCs were already there, uh, but computing power was way, way lower, and and uh, it was still much. It was still earlier days in it. So a lot of things have changed uh, in the markets and related to the markets. But certain basic things don't change, and that's the important stuff. So you know all the risk management stuff, uh, um, a lot of the market observational stuff. Bubbles and busts. A lot of a lot of elements of the markets really haven't changed, and so uh, actually, I wrote the, the most recent market was a book I wrote was uh, hedge fund market wizards, and that was uh, actually only about five years ago, and right. uh, and that was after all these changes, and in fact, I, that book has a long set. Of, I think in the back, that book has like the last chapter is like fifty. 50 rules, you know, that, it, you know, 50 bits of market wiz wizardom, you know, uh, rules picked up from the market wizards. Uh, and, you know, so num many come from that book, but they come from all the market wizard books. But the interesting thing is they come from all the market all the way back. And uh, any of those rules could have been written 30 years ago. So for the, uh, for the important stuff, um, that in that sense, I don't think the markets have really changed. Got it. And and then, what do you think is like the most important, like the psychological trait to be a successful trader? I mean, because I think trading is also a lot to do with psychology. And right, right. Uh, there was a number of important psychological traits. Uh, you want to be unemotional about trading, right? If you're yeah. if you're trading for excitement. Take up another sport, or I mean, another <laughs> endeavor, not another sport. <laughs> right. Take up another endeavor. Although, don't take up gambling as an endeavor, because at least it's <laughs> ever been a shot. Um, so, um, basically, you want to be unemotional. You want to uh, get it almost trading. If trading have done right, should be boring. I mean, the actual, the actual act of trading. Uh, you know, putting on and taking off positions and holding positions. The closer the border boring that is, the better you know you are as a trader. Uh, if there's a lot of excitement, uh, there's a quote I I used in um, actually wasn't it was in the uh, book I uh, I took a compendium of, of things I learned from the various books and called it a little book of market wizards. But the front quote I have there is from a free climber, and because uh, I thought it was so so pertinent to trading. Anyway, for those people who don't know what free climbing is. It's basically people who, who climb uh, sheer cliffs. Man, I'm talking about 2,000, 3,000 foot sheer cliffs. And not many, there are not many people in the world who do this, uh, for which reason, if you don't know what it is, it'll become clear in a second. And they do without any, any protection, no ropes. They just, that's why it's called free climbing. And uh, I mean, people who climb, who climb with ropes for protection and don't use the ropes for assistance, that's solo. But free climbing, uh, is basically without any ropes of protection, no protection at all. So the, these people will be, be 2,000 feet up on a 90-degree angle wall, hanging on by their thumbs and going up, and no protection, okay? So now the, the greatest, probably the world's best uh, uh, um, free climber is uh, Alex Arnold, and he was interviewed by uh, this American TV show called 60 Minutes, which is kind of a magazine, news magazine type show. And the reporter asks him, uh, do you ever get an adrenaline rush? Adrenaline rush. And he says, 
oh, like I was shocked by the question. Oh, no. I said, if I, if I, if I ever get an adrenaline rush, something is drastically wrong. Everything should be calm and controlled. And I read that. I actually was watching that on TV. I grabbed my remote. I stopped it, went and got a pad and paper and wrote that down because I never heard truer words spoken about trading, although it had nothing to do, you know, free climbing has nothing to do with trading in that sense. But it was absolutely true because people have this image of trading, like from Hollywood, there's all this testosterone and shouting and excitement and, and you know, it's... It's like this whole image is like a, like a like a crazy wild sport, but in reality, if you if you watch if you go watch a good trader, uh, you better bring along something to read. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> I know absolutely. Yeah, so finally, you know, so like if if I was a retail trader, you know, I mean, like a lot of us, you know, and starting off, you know, what what would you advise? I mean, yeah, okay, well, basically, here's my checklist. You're you're, you're a new trader. First of all, educate yourself. You know, forget about trading right right away. First, read uh, read books. Which books depend? You'll have to discover that for yourself. You'll eventually find what resonates, what feels right, and whatever. And then try taking that knowledge and watching markets and develop a methodology. Okay. Once you've got a methodology, then paper trade that methodology. Now, if you've gotten all past all those steps and it seems to be working, take an amount of money uh, uh, to trade. And decide on a cutoff point where the amount you lose is not going to change your life or make you miserable. Uh, uh, so, uh, and then you can begin trading. And if you hit your stop point, liquidate everything, go back to the drawing board, see what you did wrong, keep notes when you lose on a trade, what, why you lost. And, um, oh, actually, some trades you may do everything right and still lose. I shouldn't say that. But <laughs> on, trades where, on trades where you followed everything and everything was right and uh, that's not that's not what I'm talking about. But where you did something that deviated from what you should have done, make note of that. And then, if you get knocked out, review that, uh, do some more research, come back again, try it again, and just bring it out every time you lose that that maximum loss point, stop. Now, at some point, you know you'll get to the hopefully get to the point where you get ahead of the game, and at, at some point you get ahead enough so you can bring your your exit point to break even. So at that point, you're now getting a free education in the markets because if it goes back to even, you'll get out. And then you can eventually raise it above break even. Uh, but that sort of protects you. And then you just keep on going. And if you've got it all right at some point, then you'll 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 be making more than you lose. Absolutely. You know, so so last bit, you know, so can you can you share a bit about Fund Cedar and, and why Funds, Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and, and uh, hopefully we'll maybe someday see a fun seater into you, right? So fun seater, so fun seater. Here's the concept of fun seater, uh, and it's a very democratic concept actually. The idea behind fun seater is there's probably tens of thousands, thousands or ten, of yeah, thousands, tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands. Who knows? There's so many people across the globe of trade who are probably very good traders but never in their lives will ever have an opportunity to manage money because they're in the wrong country, they don't have the right pedigree, you know, any number of reasons. So the people who tend to get money uh, come through a certain, they've gone to Princeton, they work at the right hedge fund, they then get, you know, go out and start their, you know. So it, it's a very small elite that gets a chance to even manage money. It's very hard for, for uh, traders on their own Particularly if they're outside of the U.S. and don't have, haven't gone to like stellar universities to ever get to the opportunity to uh, manage money. But there's probably a lot of talented people out there. So the idea of Fund Cedar was to discover those people and to connect them with allocators who are interested in finding undiscovered trading talent. So the strategy was to uh, create a website, FundCedar.com, which traders could go link their accounts. Uh, assuming their broker is linkable, and uh, and how maybe your broker brokerage will be linkable ultimately, and uh, and they could then use all the analytics. You know, they could see their equity curve. They could have all the stats on their equity. They see individual trade stats. You know, lots of information they could do. They could apply technical trading tools to their equity curve. All sorts of neat stuff, and all of that for nothing for free because we're not in a game of selling subscriptions to the analytics. We're in a game of finding really great traders globally. And then identifying those traders 
Then on the other side, we have another company called Fundseeder Investments, who we, who have has institutional investors and family offices as as the contacts and can connect those those investors with traders that it appears to be a right fit. Uh, we ultimately will have an investor platform so they can search for their own traders, and we will also probably take. We are planning for this year to take a, a number of traders. Actually, the, do a couple of products, but the first product we've created a fund seeder index, which is based on the best five percent of traders, and and it's it's a it's a no hindsight construction uh, because of my great belief in no hindsight. Uh, so uh, I mean, this is one of my my one of the things I've railed against my whole career were people doing stuff that was clearly benefiting from hindsight and never mentioning it. So this is <laughs> to be one of the things that makes me kind of, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's fraudulent, but it's it's certainly not ethical. But in any case, so I wanted to design the um, the uh, this index so it had no hind uh, hindsight. So the way the rules work is every month, end of every month, uh, we have our own proprietary scoring system and we take the best 5% of traders and we assume equal allocation for the next month, and that, those are the results of the uh, index. And then the next month, the, uh, the process repeats. But the people who are in the index in any given month are traders who had chosen before the start of the month. And so we've run that for real time for two years. It's done enormously well, uh, both return and very low drawdown. Uh, and so we're planning, we're in the current early stages of planning to do a, a fund around that. And so that will allocate to so every month we'll be allocating to the top five percent of traders, assuming this this uh, you know those are willing to participate, assuming the product uh, goes as planned, and then we will also would like to you know, as time you know then also do a very uh, widely diversified uh, portfolio of of high we have a lot of high performing traders, uh, more than, actually more than five percent of the of the accounts are probably uh, high performing because I think people who go on to fund cedar. Are are biased. Uh, it's a biased sample because you get much more good traders than bad traders going on to the site because they're the ones who are really interested in seeing their analytics and seeing what they're doing and stuff. So anyway, so the concept is to provide a platform for traders to link their accounts. Uh, if they don't, if their broker is not linkable, they can. We have a template, an Excel template. They can upload the daily returns and then they can use like a link trader. And we're interested in that because we're looking to discover trading talent, and uh, and be the the, the go between between the trading talent and people looking for undiscovered trading talent. It's a it's a brilliant but, idea, you know. So so thanks well, a lot, Jack. It's for not my this. idea. Before we go off, it's not my <laughs> idea. It was my partner's idea, Manuel Bellari, and I agreed <laughs> to join him as one of the three founding partners. But it was definitely not my idea. Ah, super. So I'll speak to Emmanuel later, you know. And uh, so thanks a lot, Jack, for doing this. Sure, it was fun. Hopefully, it was useful to your audience. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Take Cheers. Care. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.